Fifth Sunday, we are going to have a uh, this fifth Sunday of May. We're going to have a special guest speaker. I don't know who that is, but that day it will be a youth-led worship, and we are going to be having um, we are going to honor Harry that day. We had Harry. I asked Harry to come and speak on the sanctity of life this year, first quarter, and look what God has done. I have prayed my entire adult life that movement would be made to protect the unborn in this country. Since Roe versus Wade, there, are 60, there have been 63 million abortions. You see, if, uh, Giovanni, Liz, um, Ortiz, Sylvia, you guys are new. And most, my wife was adopted, you know. So I, I'm the benefit of a woman, of a woman who chose to give my wife life. My whole life I've been told that bell will never be unrung. Look what God has done. So there is hope. There is hope. And rest assured you can still kill your babies in Nevada. For now. For now. We must continue to pray. We must continue to pray. Some other good news. Richard Derrick told me that he uh, was listening to the radio. He listens to AM radio all day at work. <clears throat> and the first choice pregnancy center that we donated or had a special offering for mentions us every, every time they're on the radio. I didn't know that. Every time they're on the radio, they give a very special thanks to Pastor Scott Hawker and Desert Hills Baptist Church for keeping them on the radio and supporting that ministry. What that ministry does is it goes to campuses and they have their own offices and they give free ultrasounds to expecting mothers. It's powerful, man. That's, but forgive me, I'm real emotional today. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. There's hope. There's hope. God is faithful. You bow with me as we pray. Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I thank you for hearing our cries. I thank you, Father God, that this is the step in the right direction. There, there will undoubtedly be states, Father, that... Forgive me. I'm so sorry. There will undoubtedly be states, Father, that uh, uh, choose to keep their abortion laws on the book, books, and I'll just leave them to you. But today, today, I praise you in the midst of your people for a righteous judgment towards the right direction. 
the defenseless Lord. That's who we are called to defend. Thank you, God. I pray, Father, through the reading and preaching of your word, your people will be built up, encouraged, emboldened, emboldened and built up, Father, as a holy temple unto you. Everybody in here knows we're not perfect, Father, but we thank you for sending your perfect son. We thank you, Father God, for being faithful in the face of an onslaught of evil and wickedness. You have chosen this time, this time to move. Help us to win souls. I pray for all the pregnant mothers. Help these women, Lord. Help the fathers of these unborn babies to know that these ladies give birth to nations. You love them. May your love be shed abroad. Tonight, Lord, as we look into your word, <clears throat> may your precepts and principles be expounded upon in such a way that we live our life pleasing to you. Pleasing to you, less offensive to men. The gospel is offensive enough, Lord. Let us not go out to pick fights. But Father God, as far as it be unto us, let us be at peace with all men and share the Prince of Peace through the good news that no one ever needs to be separated from God. When no one ever needs to fear death, there's room enough at the table for everyone. I pray that those who have yet to be scripturally baptized, whether they be in this room or they're making plans or they don't know that they have plans to come Sunday, that they will make a time to be baptized as we have watched so many be baptized as of late. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with fruitfulness. I pray that you continue to grow your church. May those who exodus the unholy places looking for your son, may they find rest in places such as, De as Desert Hills Baptist Church. And may, may, may they also find purpose in your calling here or other churches so like-minded and so heavenly called. We love you, Father. We pray for our president. We pray for the, the politics of the nation. But we pray for the pulpits and the preachers, the pastors. Give them strength, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're here uh, again in, in 1 Corinthians. What a shocker, eh? <laughs> we're still in 1 Corinthians. I, I, I've kind of subtitled tonight's... Um, message, yes, the world, the flesh, and the devil in regards to the principles and precepts of our prince. Principles and precepts of our prince of whom Paul, Paul was a follower of. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I've asked, uh, I asked Brother Love to read chapter 10 verse 23. Paul writes, by way of the Holy Spirit, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. I've spoken of this word edify before. It comes from the, uh, the Latin edificio. It means to build up. Not all things build us up. Sunday, um, Sunday, I, I, I kind of ruffled some feathers, I'm sure. Uh, to speak, although I will say that Austin and Ashley are here, so praise God that they weren't too upset. And my son-in-law dropped by. And uh, he had to go, though. So that being said, um, I, I, I talked a little bit about Walt Disney and, and cartoons and, and these movies and our entertainment. Uh, it, you know, you can go see a movie. Uh, you can go and be entertained. You can go and take in sustenance from different places. And uh, even as they are offered by different people, uh, however, not all of these things have the most wholesome of backgrounds. 
And certainly, uh, they seem to be more like bubblegum than anything else. I, I like the term bubblegum music because it always reminds me of Juicy Fruit. My grandmother used to have a pack of it in her purse. And uh, first would come the warning, then would come the slap, and then a piece of Juicy Fruit gum when I was wiggling too much in the uh, pew when I was a little boy. Uh, the Juicy Fruit gum came last because she knew it wasn't going to last long. If you, ever, you guys remember Juicy Fruit, it was one chew, two chew, and then no taste. Uh, but yes, that, that's, that is the way of the world. See, that is the way of the world. And these are the things that the world offers, the flesh would desire. And the, within the principles and precepts that Paul lays out here of our Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, he says, you can have juicy fruit gum. It's just not going to help you. In fact, it's probably going to rot your teeth. Uh, the Bible doesn't lie. Well, one of the things I love about the Bible is that it tells the truth, even though the truth sometimes is, is ugly and doesn't paint the truth in the best light. Uh, the Bible says sin has pleasure for a season. Sin has pleasure for, the se for a season, but the end thereof is death and destruction. Now, you might not die right away, just like your teeth might not rot out the very first piece of juicy fruit you have. Ah, but if you eat it on a constant and consistent basis, for one thing, you get acclimated to the taste. So one piece of juicy fruit at a time just ain't enough. Soon it's half a pack. And then what do you have? You have to go ahead and get a whole big old thing of hubba bubba too. And you just got to keep shoving it in there in order to continue to be gratified on these things. Uh, I'm showing my age with hubba bubba, but maybe I should have mentioned bubble yum. Do you remember bubble yum? Uh, my favorite was big chew because it was like the baseball packet of cha. You throw it in your mouth and you could just put a whole gob of it in there. Now I'm hungry. The world, ha the world offers these things that titillate the flesh. It's manipulated by the devil. And there are things that we can take part of that are not overtly sinful, but they don't lead anywhere. And it's within our liberty to do these things. I would just say, hey, if it, I don't like wasting time. You know, I don't like wasting time. Like, I want to do something that's going to build me up. You know, I, I would like to, if I'm going to zone out on a YouTube video, right? Well, I'd at least like to watch something that maybe, like a, a, a quick YouTube video on how to make your own solar panel or something, you know? Uh, maybe uh, Bill and I were talking about lithium batteries. I can already tell you right now, I'm going to go home and I'm going to watch YouTube videos about lithium batteries. I want to watch something that, that enriches me. I'd like to listen to something that enriches me. Uh, something that if, if it enriches me, I may be able to give out as well. Instead, instead of so much bubblegum music, maybe a little more Mozart. Where are the Mozarts today? Where are the Beethovens? Don't tell me about Steve Jobs. You know, Steve, you know what Steve Jobs used to do? Steve Jobs used to uh, during the middle of his workday, he'd go and put his feet in the toilet in the men's restroom in order to calm him down. It was a way of stress management for him. It's not a dude I'm going to follow. He was an atheist. I don't, wanna, I don't care about Steve Jobs. Does my Apple phone work? You bet it does. That's all I care about. But where are those, those geniuses of the past? Those who had such brilliant flares that they invented things from nothing instead of just building upon other people's work. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now this is in direct context to the fact that there were those who were eating meats that had been sacrificed to idol, idols that some people were offended that they were eating them uh, because they thought that that somehow degraded them. Well, there's nothing wrong with eating any meat on the planet unless you're going to partake in the same spiritual impetus 
that sponsored it. In fact, Paul, if you turn a page over, Paul says in verse 20, 27, he says, if, it, if any of them that believe not bid you uh, to feast, or you shouldn't eat, and you be dis, uh, disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. He says, you know, in order, in order to love your brother who may be offended because they see you eating something or doing something, that they have a personal conviction about. He says, if you ever sit down at a table, the principle, I'll get to the overriding principle in a second, but specifically says, if you ever sit down at a table and somebody places a, a dinner in front of you, don't ask them if it was sacrificed to demons. Now that sounds like the 90s, don't ask, don't tell rule. And it kind of is. For your own conscience sake, and so that if you partake in something, you're innocent thereof in the eyes of other people. And we're going to talk about the eyes of other people in a second. But let's talk about the precept and principle that Paul is getting at here. Because it almost sounds like a contradiction. But it's not. Remember, the overriding laws are the law of liberty and the law of love. We are at liberty to pretty much do what we want. However, if we love God, if we love Jesus, we will do as he commanded. And Jesus said his great commandment, not the great commission, his great commandment was love one another even as I have loved you. Christ never set out to offend someone who was weak in the faith. Christ was always about building upon whatever little faith they may have had. The one, we spoke Monday night about the woman with the issue of the blood. Great faith crawling between the feet of the people. If I can only but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. Power. He said, it says that it felt as though power had left him. And he turned and said, who touched my garment? And she said, I did. And he says, your faith has made you well. Continuing to build upon that. See, God in Christ meets us where we are. He meets us where we are. But he loves us too much to let us stay that way. Now, I usually say that at the invitation time. But I'm saying it at the beginning of tonight's message, or, or midway through possibly, through the message, to let you know. You've been saved for a while. Great. Well, let's grow a little, yeah? Let's grow. Let's grow past John 3.16. Let's, let's learn even he came not to judge. Let's learn even he came, he came that we might live forever and eternal with God, yes. However, let's learn that we should let our light so shine before men. If we are saved, it, we know it is not by works. However, uh, James says, if you say, if you say you are saved and you have no works, uh, he says you have a dead faith. He says, I am saved and I show you by my works. What works are those? Well, Remember, it is not works to be saved. It's works that are inspired by your salvation. See, He will meet you exactly where you are. And even if you've been walking with him for a very, very long time, and, and there's a, you're in a bit of a rut, that's not a problem because God is with you in the rut. Now, I will tell you, if you ask him, he will help you get up out of the rut. And that's, let's face it, I think what most churchgoers fall into. I remember telling Bob Dean once, I said, and he was the chairman of deacons here for years. I said, Bob, I just don't have a hunger and a thirst for the word like I did. And he goes, huh, Scott, we all go through seasons like that, man. Don't worry about it. Just keep asking, keep seeking. It'll come back. And he was right. He was right. But see, even though maybe... Maybe I wasn't, quote unquote, feeling it at the time. Christ had never forsaken me. And he met me right where I was in the rut of my study, in the rut of my walk with him. And that's a natural thing for us all. Ah, but God in his supernatural ability gives us precepts and principles to live by so that we can continue to be pleasing unto him. While at the same time, not endeavoring to be man-pleasers, but certainly not setting out to upset others. Does that make sense to you tonight? Verse 31, whether you eat, whether therefore you eat 
or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for what? The glory of God. Does it glorify God? If you go, neener, neener, I can eat that, and I know it really upsets you. No. That's your pride. That's your vanity. Ah, but it does glorify God if you consider someone more important than your own thoughts and desires to abstain from something. Now, again, I don't carry this real, real far because I don't like letting people be in control of me. And people will use this as a form of control if you're not careful. That's what religions do. You see? But see, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you know what is kind and what is compassionate as opposed to that which is legalistic and harsh or prideful and puffed up. He says, give, verse 32... Uh, give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. Now, this is fascinating because he gives three distinct different groups here. To the Jew, to the Gentile, or to the church. I just throw that out there because some people believe the church has replaced Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. The church has been grafted in. Uh, all newborn believers have been grafted in into Israel. We are spiritual Israel for sure. God is going to save a remnant of these Jews. But he says, don't go set about to offend the Jews. And don't go about to offend the unsaved Gentiles. Don't offend the unsaved Jews. Don't offend the unsaved Gentiles. Or the church. The church. Now, we're in church tonight. Where we are gathered together. Uh, hey, listen. I, I don't think church is a place for personal statements. You know, I have a favorite football team. You don't see me wearing that jersey, do you? Uh, I, there was a young man that I was watching preach at, a, uh, at one of these modern rock and roll Southern Baptist churches up here on Black Mountain. And I, I tried not to watch. I tried to just listen because the, the guy had some good messages. I'm not going to lie. They were good mess. Not that I would lie. We're in church. That, that would be bad. But he had some good messages. They were sound. But I tell you what, what happened is one day I did look, and, and he was he, he was wearing a Ramones T-shirt. Now I'm a I'm gonna I'm gonna make everybody think less of me, Rico. But that's all right. You have a ponytail, I don't. So I'm a big punk rocker from way back. I, I loved the Ramones when I was a kid, you know. But. Church, the assembly is not a place to make a personal statement. So I, I emailed the man. I said, brother, I'm a pastor in Las Vegas. I've enjoyed your sermons. Why do you make this personal statement from the pulpit with the Ramones? Because there might be one out there who is a, uh, a drug addict, and they might go home and listen to uh, I Want to Be Sedated. That's, which is a song about drug addiction. Or there might be somebody out there who had, uh, ha had either been abused and traumatized as a child, or, or maybe, maybe they're trying to justify their own abusing, and they'll go home and sing, let's beat the brat with a baseball bat. That's a Ramon song, see? I know, <laughs> Joanne's like, and you listen to that, Pastor? Hey, I was 15. You know, I don't know. When you're 15, you listen to anything with a beat, I guess. Or, hey, I want to be buried in a pet cemetery, you know. Hey, I said, brother, you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you represent the kingdom. Just, just wear a polo, man. Don't draw any attention to yourself. Think highly of others rather than yourself, you know. I don't need to know who your favorite football team is. Now you want to come over to my house and hang out? That's cool, man. Wear, wear your jersey. I love it. But I don't need to know. And when we come together, we don't want to do anything that would be offensive to the brethren. Now, I'm not saying that you have to uh, come as totally vanilla pie as possible, although I love vanilla. Um, I'm just saying we think higher of others than we do ourselves. This is the principle and the precept that Paul is trying to lay out over and over again when it comes to, a, to being offensive. Does this make sense tonight? Well, good, because we're going to hit it a few more times. He says, even as I please 
all men, uh uh-oh, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that ye may be saved. Now, we, we, we want to be pleasing to all men, but in Galatians chapter 1, he says, don't be man-pleasers. And indeed, Peter said, we ought to please God rather than man. So where does that end? Well, first of all, let's, let's look at 9.22 of Corinthians. 9.22. Paul says, again, unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain, that I might win the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain, that I might win them that are under the law. This is all for the gospel's sake. So he doesn't become a distraction. So they don't see Paul, but rather they see what Paul is preaching, which is grace and mercy to the believer. Unmerited favor given to anyone who should receive it. And not getting what we do deserve, which is mercy. What do we deserve? The whole planet deserves to be wiped clean. So in this, he says, These things I try to be pleasing in, that I might win the more. All right, then, where does that end? I'm glad you asked. Turn with, the, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. Because here we have the converse or the extreme opposite. In Corinthian, in, in Corinth, we have this real liberal church. In Galatia, we have a church that is falling back into legalism. I, I, I tend to swing more towards the legalistic side. I don't say that with any pride. I just say that because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I know you might not see it to look at me or come into my office. All I will say is this. The perfectionist doesn't mean no clutter. My clutter is perfectly cluttered. (laughs) I want to do my best all the time. All the time. I want to be my best. I want to do my best. Heavy burden. Heavy burden. I rely, so I fall right back into grace and mercy because I'm saved by unmerited favor. By the mercies of God, I've been given repentance and I've been born again. But here in Galatia, we have those Judaizers. I called them Gnostics one day. Please forgive me. My brain doesn't work as well as it used to. But now that I'm feeling better, it's working better. They're not Gnostics. They're Judaizers. They're trying to say, in order to be saved, you must first return to the old covenant. In order to, in order to receive the new covenant, you must first come through the old covenant and the law and be circumcised. And Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Galatians, I marvel that ye so soon are removed From him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There are other gospels. There are other gospels that don't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. Um, So there's the gospel uh, of feminism. There's the gospel of humanism. There's the gospel of Marxism. There's the gospel of woke theology. These are all different Gospels that place an emphasis on everything and anything else other than the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see? It's by faith in Jesus Christ and His selfless sacrifice that we are saved. We look at the cross and we gain our conviction once we have been told, once we have come to the understanding through the gospel, that Jesus Christ was sinless, perfect, without blemish, and and went to the cross willingly as a payment for us. And out of that flows our gratitude. Out of that flows all of the expressions of what real love is. Jesus Christ said, love one another even as I have loved you. The other night, I gave a pop quiz. Of course, we went over for 30 minutes in the men's study. But I I, I said, hey, come on now. Tell me, how did Jesus love us? Well, unconditionally. Yes, he did. He loved us and went to the cross unconditionally. Uh, How else did he love us? Well, he sacrificed himself. Amen. So love is sacrifice. Amen. How else did he love us? Crickets. Crickets. 
people were kind of confused. What, what do you mean, how else did he love us? Well, did he not serve? He said, the Son of Man has come to serve and not be served. This is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. And yet he's the one who got down on his knees and washed the filth from the disciples' feet. He taught them. How did he teach them? I see no classrooms set up in any of the four Gospels. You know how he taught them? He spent time with them. He spent time with them. One of the things I shared Monday night is I'm becoming more and more suspect of people who say, oh, I don't want to go to church, man. I'm going to spend time with those hypocrites. What do you mean, hypocrites? Do you love God? Then you must love your brother. And if you are of God in Christ, you should be in fellowship with the brethren. No mercenary Christians. See? No lone sheep. There's only lone wolves. No. He spent time with the people that he loved. Monday night, Mondays are my day off, folks. We were going to switch the Bible study to Thursday night. That little church met on Thursday nights. We gave, I gave up Thursday nights, moved the study back to Monday nights. Why? Oh, man, I beat a path to come spend time with you people on Mondays. You people, you know. Yeah. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I want to spend time with you. He says, why another gospel? I, I, I marvel. I marvel at this. He says, well, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, but though we, verse 8, though we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Isn't that neat how he said, whether it's us or even an angel that preaches another gospel? Do you know there's, there's a big old castle up on the mountain over here, and they preach another gospel that was given to them by an angel? See? Well, he says, let them be accursed. Or, if you get a chance, share the good news with them. See, it's a system of works that builds castles, right? But it's the grace of God that saves souls. He says, let them be accursed. And we said before, so I, I, now, so I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek, now here's the key verse, do I seek to please men? Or if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now herein lies the rub in the juxtaposition of the two books. Paul says, hey, we should be pleasing to the people around us. And yet here Paul says, what, do I please men or do I please God? It's not a contradiction. Let me tell you why. The principle is this. You can catch more flies with honey than you can vinegar. Amen or oh me. Right. I mean, you got some Christians, they walk down the hallway, you look at them, you just turn and go the other way. They're so sour. You don't want to, you know. But the principle and precept that Paul is talking about in Galatians, this is not about reaching the lost. This is the lost. This is the lost who have demanded that the saved come under the Old Testament laws to please them and their convictions. Wrong. Wrong. Unless we are saved by works and grace is made of none effect. One of the stories I heard tonight in my meeting beforehand, won't mention the name because this will go out on the radio. How the... How... It's not just this liberal sense that has gone through the Southern Baptist Convention. The liberal sense has given way to a far more dangerous, far more dangerous and insidious legalism. Apparently there was a man who had cheated on his wife 15 years ago. And they had reconciled then... And apparently he held a position 
as a deacon in the church. They fired the pastor. How dare you ordain a man that cheated on his wife? Before we go any further, let me be clear here. I don't condone adultery. Those who practice such things will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Ah, but those who repent of such things seek forgiveness. And here's one for you. You ready? Say amen. amen. Seek to reconcile with their spouse. And there's enough grace and mercy there. They are blessed. See, all the woke liberalism in, all, in the whole world, what it totally and utterly lacks, grace and mercy. It's a different gospel. The legalists, the Judaizers here, it, 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 they, would, they were using the name of Jesus Christ. They acknowledged his sacrifice on the cross. However, it just wasn't quite sufficient enough to really get you saved. That's bad news, folks. That's bad news. Because here's the thing. It's circumcision today. It's driving an Audi 500 tomorrow. It's driving a certain car, circumcision today, and wearing blue ties always to church, or you're really not going to be saved. When does it end? It never ends. It never ends. We are to be pleasing with the aroma of of Christ, who is the life, the quickening spirit in our life. We're to be pleasing, expounding upon, extending grace and mercy with wisdom and discernment, 100%. However, we're not to please people to jump through their hoops if they say, you're not really saved because you know A, B, and C. Well, who are you? See, you're starting to add to the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is such as this. It's three parts. If you take any one away, it falls. Add anything to it, it becomes a monstrosity. The gospel is death, burial, and resurrection. It's not death, burial, resurrection, beads, candles, special prayers, saints, icons, circumcision... It is Jesus Christ, his sacrifice and resurrection, and nothing else. We're all saying amen here. How come the rest of them don't get it? Joanne, help me out here. They don't get it because they're lost. I don't expect lost people to act saved. But we're going through Galatians and taking pit stops in I mean, we're going through Corinthians and taking a pit stop in Galatians to make sure that our borders are shored up. Because I firmly believe as these churches fold, and they are folding. See, I said firmly during COVID, there will be churches that will never open their doors again. That has happened. Uh, but the, as these flee, these, these churches that are going the way of the world... Undoubtedly, they will come, and they can join us uh, if they're born again, baptized believers, but they may bring with them and drag with them some of the old habits, some of the old philosophies and ways. And I'm done with that. I'm, I'm, done, with, I'm done with the playground Christianity. I'm done with, uh, with T-shirt evangelism. Hey, you know what? We're going to keep moving forward and seeking his righteousness and his kingdom and just leave the consequences to him. In case you haven't noticed, that's all we've really been doing, and God's been blessing us. God's been blessing us. And, and I, 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 he's been blessing us with you. <laughs> I mean, you're the blessing. You're the uh, Giovanni, Liz, uh, O.T., uh, uh, Sylvia. Yeah, uh, you guys are the blessing. Uh, Sonia, you and you're now bringing your son, Roman. Uh, Rico, with the ponytail and all. <laughs> he continues to bless us in spite of us not doing everything the rest of the world and the flesh would demand. And there's no disco ball in here. There's no flashing lights. I'm certainly not as young as I used to be, and I'm not real pretty to look at. 
No skinny jeans. Just God. Just Christ. Just forgiveness. Redemption. Reconciliation. Amen.